I think we have been very clear as to how this particular building collapsed. Um, fire induced local damage uh, to connections and beams and girders, as I've explained uh, through uh, the posters that you see here, over a period of time uh, when the fires reached the east side of the building on, on the lower floors. Once that happened, there was a critical column, the girder that failed between 79 and 44, which then started a cascade of floor failures uh, in the vicinity of column 79, over nine stories. Once you had that sequence of events, you then had a buckled column, a single buckled column. And when that single buckled column occurred, you found a spread of that failure from column to column, uh, south to north, and then from east to west, all the way across the building, and eventually the facade of the building came down. So it was a progression of events. It was not concurrent. Hi, I'm Ariane Cohen from Popular Mechanics. Um, conspiracy theorists have made much of the way that the building fell into what they say is a very uh, tidy pile. They say it's consistent with demolition. Can you explain why the footprint was so tidy? Well, um, on the northeast side of the building, as you look at this particular uh, graphic again, you see the, well, first of all, you see that there are long span floors uh, in both the uh, north side and the east side. But if you look at this, but these three columns, 79, 80, and 81, the area that they are covering, the, the uh, floor area that they are carrying is very large, and particularly 79, which is carrying about 2,000 square feet of floor area. So essentially, um, when that happened, it's the interior of the building that failed. An interior column failed, followed by 80 and 81, followed by the interior of the building going from east to west. So what you're seeing is the interior of the building collapsing, followed by the exterior. So you get the impression of it being like a uh, controlled demolition. It was not a controlled demolition at all, as we have demonstrated through our calculations. This would not even, controlled demolition usually involves uh, putting charges on multiple columns and they're time sequenced so that you'll see a, a particular uh, uh, a, uh, a progression of failures. If you go and look at websites, you'll find how they look. But this building did not collapse in the form of a controlled demolition. Uh, hi, Christoph Röckerath from ZDF German Television. Um, as you know, obviously, by the way the, the collapse looked, many people thought it was, I think, is a controlled demolition. Um, and so it's at the center of attention for many conspiracy theorists. How did this anticipation and maybe pressure from that scene or the other side influence your work in any way? What did you feel about this uh, pressure during your investigation? Well, um, I think it's very important to recognize how we got started. It got started because when these three buildings collapsed on 9-11. Um, several people in the professional community, it's not only NIST, wanted to really find out how these buildings collapsed and you know, did they perform as they were expect there may, may have been expected to perform. Now clearly buildings are not designed to withstand airplane impact. But given that, uh, did they perform appropriately? And of course, the families of the victims had a great interest in finding out why these buildings collapsed because they wanted to know why, why their loved ones had lost their lives. So that was uh, the basis on which we got started. And our, the basis of our research or, or our investigation was, one, to determine why and how the buildings collapsed, two, to determine if the loss of life and injuries were high or low, Three, to determine the procedures and practices that were used throughout the life of these buildings uh, to make sure if that had any impact on the outcome on 9-11. And last but not least, really to improve building safety through improvements to codes and standards and practices that might be warranted as a result of what we find. Uh, it, it was really, that was the driving force. And of course, that's what we uh, dedicated ourselves to do. And at the end of the day, that's what we are here to, to present our results on. Uh, with regard to uh, the alternative theories, uh, yes, uh, as with all investigations, we, are, we were very open to all the possibilities of how this building may have come about. Um, well, we were very open. 
We considered all of the theories, and once we had looked at them, it, and in our technical judgment, we decided what would be the most credible of those hypotheses to further investigate. Obviously, fire was one of them. Diesel fuel was a second one. Third was, of course, uh, uh, controlled demolition. And, and the fourth was to see if the fact that this building, office building, was built on top of an electric substation, if that had any role to play, because there were some critical elements, like transfer elements, um, beams, girders, and cantilever overhangs that had been put to, to make this possible. And of course, we ruled out that those had any critical role to play. And ultimately, what trumped was the fact that fires, in fact, did play a critical role. We're going to take another question from the web. Yes, we have a question from Bill Jenkins with uh, Building Safety Journal. And his question is, understanding that tempered steel and concrete superstructure was initially invented for its ability to withstand uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. Okay. For your just released report executive summary, uh, this was the first known instance of total collapse primarily due to fires and further that fuel oils did not play a role in the collapse. What created such intense heat to make WTC-7 explosively collapse while the columns remained significantly below melting point? Was it office materials that your report claims caused this? Is this not impossible? Uh, no, it's not impossible. Um, we have been designing uh, buildings for fire for uh, at least the, the modern practice traces back about 100 years, uh, 80 to 100 years the practice developed then. Uh, it's based on something called the fire resistance ratings of buildings, a test method that was developed. Uh, those methods have focused heavily on, this, on building fires that occur because of building contents. Uh, the contents of buildings are, are Office furnishings, uh, which in, in our building furnishings might include carpets and furniture of, of normal uh, everyday use. It includes partitions, workstations, computers uh, in the modern day. And, and those furnishings, in fact, uh, you know, we have a good wealth of information as to how those fires perform and, in fact, can cause safety concerns in buildings. And that's why we have this methodology that's been developed over 80 to 100 years. That has worked really well. Um, it's only in this particular case where, because of the, the combination of factors associated with the design of this particular building, where the effect of thermal expansion uh, played a dominant role in causing its collapse. So um, this does not uh, necessarily um, imply that um, that the current methods are inappropriate. It simply says we have, we have identified a new phenomenon that previously has not been seen to have caused building collapse. Okay. Um, could you talk oh, um, wait for the microphone, please, and identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Mike Shea with Baltimore Grassroots Media. Could you uh, talk about how you were able to rule out the, the controlled demolition or any controlled demolition hypothesis uh, and, and also address whether you looked at um, some of the um, studies that Stephen Jones did about uh, the evidence of uh, thermate um, possibly being used to uh, cut through the beams. Yeah, as I said before, we, we, we conducted this investigation with an open mind. And um, then we decided on those of the possible hypothesis that would be really credible enough for us to evaluate further. And controlled demolition was one of them. And the way we proceeded to do that is, of course, there are many ways we could do it. Uh, you know, we could have done it the way controlled demolition is actually done in practice, where charges are placed on multiple columns, uh, which would imply a huge amount of charges to be placed. We instead decided, what is the worst case scenario, meaning what is the minimum amount of charge we could use to build this bring building down? And when we looked at that, we said, well, if column 79 is, is in fact what caused this building to come down under fire, let's assume we have a, a charge that can be placed directly on column 79, which, of course, most people would not know is the critical column, um, just because that was not, we found that, found that out after the analysis that we did. 